Adam Zampa joining us right now. I can hear some birds in the background, which means he's in the bush somewhere. Uh, it sounds relaxing, mate. Are you relaxed? Yeah, definitely. Um, I am currently about three hours west of Bundaberg. Um, yeah, the, the best idea I could give you is that it's it's Australia, that's for sure. Um, I'm at a family property in the middle of Queensland, so I'm yeah, certain, certainly relaxed. A long way away from civilization and cricket at the moment. <laughs> it sounds like it. It sounds like it because a couple of weeks ago, the news came through that um, the IPL wasn't for you in 2024. Um, I don't know if you can release why you came to that decision, but as you sit there right now, you're pretty comfortable with that decision? Yeah, I mean, um, I'll be quite honest with you about it. Like, I, I, There's several reasons why the IPL wasn't for me this year. Um, I think the most important one was the fact that it's that it's a world cup year and um i'm just i'm completely drained from 2023 um we spent i did i did the full ipl last year obviously the world cup was three months in india as well so um i had the best intentions of trying to play the ipl again this year but once it push came to shove i felt like i just couldn't really offer the rajasthan rules the best version of myself um and looking forward to to the World Cup, that's you know that's what's more important to me. That's for sure. When what are the key indicators for you knowing like you, you you're a cricketer at heart, so you, you want to play as well as you can wherever you are. But what are the indicators for you that tell you that oh maybe this fuel gauge of mine is um, closer to empty than full, and I maybe need to reassess how I'm approaching things. Yeah, it's just it's it's the mental capacity for for the grind. Um, as cricketers, you kind of get into the grind and it's easy to stay in it. But once it gets to a point where you're at, you're at tipping point, um, which I was, you know, towards the end of cricket season, um, including, you know, a few little niggles um, as well, which, yeah, basically it came down to my decision um, being, you know, I probably need to put my body and my mental health first. Um, and then you throw a lot of other things into the equation as well, like the fact that I've got a small family a young family, um, I should say, who, you know, it's not easy to spend nine weeks um, in India in my situation where, you know, I'm, I'm fighting for my spot in the team as well. It's not like I can say to myself, well, that's all right, I've got 14 games to prepare for, for a World Cup. I don't know whether or not that's actually going to be two games or four games or six games. So, um, you know, I, I kind of worked out that maybe just a rest, putting my family first, putting my body first was... Um, was better for me so it, it's not an easy decision because you've always got that you know that voice in the back of your mind going oh you know pulling out of the IPL what are people gonna say um what what happens the next time you want to go to the IPL do, do people kind of paint you with that brush um but I wasn't too fussed about it once I made that decision I, I knew it was the right one what's the what's that first week off then like when you're you're craving a bit of uh downtime um, is it full daddy daycare duties or is it uh, unwinding in other ways? Yeah, definitely. That's that's the other whole, you know, thing that you have to consider in this situation is the fact that, you know, our wives, um, full-time parents, when we're away, they're doing it all by themselves. Um, and in, in my, my situation too, my wife's running a property. She's trying to start a business, Um so for me, it was yeah, a nice opportunity for me to give back to her, um, be a father, give her time away from the child to, to kind of concentrate on what she's trying to concentrate on, which was, um, it's been a nice feeling. You know, it's been five or six weeks now since I've actually been home from that New Zealand tour. So we're well and truly in the swing of, of dad mode. And um, yeah, it's, it's been nice. And you, I don't know, you wherever you are, several hours west of civilization there in Queensland, you sometimes flick on the Cricket Australia app in the morning and look at the scores from the IPL and go, hey, look at that. That team went for 270 off 20. It's not the worst IPL to, to miss at the moment, given how much <laughs> tap everyone's copying with the ball. Yeah, my dad actually mentioned that. Um, I went down to the south coast to visit my dad a couple of weeks ago and he said, yeah, it's probably not a bad IPL to miss this one. It seems like it's pretty high score and I uh, didn't... Um, you know, shy away from the fact that I said, mate, most T20 games are heading that way now anyway, so better get used to it. Um, but, yeah, I've, I've been flicking the scores on every now and then. I'm interested to see how the 
how the the guys are going. Um, you know, obviously got some mates, um, mm. Australian cricketers who I, you know, interested to see how they're going and tracking for our for our World Cup um, crack as well. So um, yeah, I'll turn it on. Yeah, it's not too far from that World Cup. But let's firstly look back at the World Cup that happened. Um, it, it does feel like six years ago, but it was only a little over six months ago in India. What what burns in the memory for you about that experience and that victory? Um, yeah, I, I think I've said it in the media since then that I still can't wrap my head around it. Um, and still waking up some mornings now, I go, that didn't, that didn't really happen, did it? Um, you know, like, always, it's... Someone like me, I've always felt like I'm a bit of a battler. Um, I'm not the most talented cricketer in the team, that's for sure. If you actually, if, if I'll be honest with you, I always feel like I'm probably the least talented cricketer in the Australian cricket team, but I've always had the burning desire to, to try and stay in the team, do well in the team, and I've never really thought that you know winning World Cup was a was a serious goal until, until you do it. And we did it a few years ago, and then... It was definitely something that I wanted to achieve in India with with that team, um, but once you do it, it's like oh, this is this is pretty big. Um, no one gave us a chance, especially after the two games. People were writing myself off after two games, which was fair enough as well. Um, but yeah, to to lift the trophy at the end and have a party for a few days after was was a bloody nice feeling. I bet. You kept receipts too, uh, I noticed. <laughs> I mean, who were those receipts from? And in all seriousness, like you, you can look at it as a, a cheap way to get motivation, but it is a factor, I'm guessing, as a professional sports person, um, that that can serve as something as a bit of an incentive in some kind of way. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a massive Kirby Enthusiasm fan. Um, a lot of yeah. people will know this about me, but I, I love Larry David. Um, and most of the things that he does in life are out of spite. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if I'm similar to him, but every time I go on the cricket, cricket field, I always feel like there's someone that I'm looking to spite, whether or not it's, you know, someone in the media or just, you know, a memory of, a, of my childhood cricket where I was always battling for, you know, a spot against the city boy or um, something like that. So it's always been, well, my wife mentioned it to me a few weeks ago. She's like, geez, you need to stop going on the field out of spite. And I'm like, well, it's, it's working for me at the moment. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the receipts, the receipts thing is, um, I don't know, I guess Tom Brady, when he won the Super Bowl a few years ago, he said that he kept some receipts potentially about, you know, people saying he was aging and all that. And then I just had this funny idea after we won the World Cup in 2021 to get a few of the old receipts that, you know, journalists, um, the papers were writing about us, um, ex-players in particular were saying about us, and say it during the team song after we'd won the World Cup. And it got a good crack. The boys had a good laugh. Um, so I thought, you know, a few years later, we've won another World Cup. Why not use the same gag again? And it, it went down a treat. Righto then, I'll use a bit of a Larry David because he, I dare say, had a uh, a say in how this episode was written in Seinfeld when we all, we go all the way back to Ned Isakoff and the Chinese restaurant that he got banned from, um, naming names. Can you please name names, Adam Zampa? Well, the, the, whole, the, <laughs> the whole gag was around the fact that the boys couldn't ask me who... The quotes had come from okay. and then the funniest part of the whole thing was they'd be like come on mate who, who the fuck said that and i'd be like ah oh. oh steve war and they'd be like oh tugger <laughs> fuck mate <laughs> um yeah i i honestly i think i made up those names when i got asked but yeah, it's just <laughs> uh, the last world cup went for so long from start to finish, yeah. by the time the final had come around, I struggled to find any quotes because they were from <laughs> two months prior. Yeah, well, things changed, don't they, over that course? And it was the, the classic case of starting at a certain point but peaking for 
the performance in the final, which I, I guess makes it sweeter. And the celebrations they've been we've been well versed in what Travis Head got up to and Mitch Marsh, Marshy's little offsider there and and getting on with it. But are these things that I don't know? People listening to this when they win a, a park cricket competition, playing summer with their mates that they've played with for twenty years from school, they revisit ten years, fifteen years later. Is it similar in a way? It, it's still at its kind of core a bunch of mates doing something great and you'll remember it for the rest of time yeah absolutely um yeah for me like looking back on the the teammates in particular and um the coaching staff that were involved in that world cup it's you know like i i moved to south australia when i was a young man andrew mcdonald was someone that i you know we moved to south australia at the same time um and he was kind of someone that i leaned on a little bit um, you know, being a young boy who just moved to a new city by himself, um, Travis Head, I moved in with Travis and that was an experience in itself. He was, <laughs> you know, fair to say a slob of a young man. Um, and, you know, you look through the whole team, Mitch Marsh was my under-19s captain, Josh Hazelwood was, I played under-19s with him, um, you know, Stoin and I are close mates. Um, you know, Alex Carey, I played a lot of state cricket with. So you can you go down the whole eleven. There's experience with, with those guys, not in that World Cup in particular, but you know, once you put all the names together and think about what we've all been through to get to that point, it's um, it's pretty amazing. So yeah, it'll be definitely something that we look back on together. I think you know we we had the ring presentation a couple of months after, and if. Um, you know, the 10-year reunion is anything to go by from that. It's going to be a good night. I bet. <laughs> I bet. Um, we had Matthew Wade on recently and he dobbed you in for sabotaging his ski goggles. Um, have you got something on Matthew Wade now? He's just a T20 gun for hire and, you know, you don't have to deal with him if you're playing Shield for New South Wales against him or, or maybe a bit of big bash action against each other. But, um, yeah, you, you basically... You have the floor here. You can retort against Matthew Wade and dob him in on something else. I think um, you must have put Wadey on the spot there and he couldn't potentially remember what had happened to those ski goggles because I maybe, I maybe I've got this wrong, but I do not remember touching his goggles at all. Um, <laughs> I did see the little video of you guys talking to him and he'd thrown me under the bus and I was like, hang on, I don't know, don't know if he's got his wires crossed there. Um, but I haven't, I haven't really got much on Wadey. He's... Um, yeah, I know, he's a, he's a ripper. We all love playing with Wade, so hopefully he's not a T20 gun for hire just, just yet. Still got a, hopefully another celebration left in him with him. How's that right thigh of yours going? Um, have you run out of room just in case you have extra trophies to give <laughs> to Larry David? And then, like, I mean, are you going to you gonna have one of those wraparound tats that's going to go in the front of your quad to just trophy upon trophy? That's the, that's the aim, I'm guessing. Yeah, well, I'm looking at it now. I've got... Larry David's left and right hand full. Um, and then, I don't know, I reckon I've got a couple of World Cups in me left at least. So if we get maybe one, two or three more, you know, um, being positive about that anyway. Um, I think maybe Kramer might be next. Yeah. Has anyone looked at that tat and gone, who's that and guessed someone that it's totally not? Um, no, I think... If you you either if you know you know it's kind of it's kind of that tattoo like people know it's Larry David they know it's Larry David but if they have no idea who it is they just kind of go that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so they haven't got someone coming up saying why well, you got George Costanza on your your leg there so yeah good well, everyone gets it. Someone everyone someone thought it. someone thought I'd got a tattoo of myself in thirty years time holding the World Cup trophies, and I was like, why would I do that? <laughs> it's Larry David. It's quite obviously Larry David. Yeah. And ho hopefully for your sake, you don't have the Devon head that uh, Larry David has, and you've got a nice head of hair, so I think you'll hang on to that, mate. So yeah, it's all I'll good. be okay. I'll be okay then. Yeah. There's a reason why I'm wearing a hat. Um, <laughs> the summer just played. Uh, you played every white ball game for Australia. Uh, were you happy with that? And you, you mentioned before about you, you got to the end of it all and basically went, time out so it was obviously physically taxing and also mentally taxing but are you proud of what you were able to to dish out for for australia 
Um, yeah, I mean, um, playing for Australia is really important important to me. Um, I mean, I've always tried to prioritise it. Um, and as I said to you before, I've always felt like I'm really lucky to be in the position that I'm in. Um, I've worked super hard and done a, I, you know, I'm really proud of the job that I've done in the last few years to make it my spot. So I'm not easily going to give up games for Australia and it's going to be the case for the next mm. couple of years as well. Like I've, I've said to the selectors, the coach, um, you know, I, I really want to do my best to try and play every game for Australia. And if that means sacrificing a bit of franchise cricket like I have now, then I'll definitely do that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's important. Those those little series that you win in between, the one against New Zealand and West Indies, to be a part of those is really important. But even the West Indies series and the one-day one group, the new one-day group moving forward, I felt like it was really important to have some mixed experience around for that too. Um, you know, to see guys like Jake Fraser McGurk come on, Xavier Bartlett, Spencer Johnson, um, and win that series as well was like a really important one for me personally to be involved in just looking forward to the future potentially playing with a new bunch of young guys as well so yeah I mean it was a long summer um getting back from the world cup was was an amazing feeling to to have that trophy but then to you know I felt like big bash I might have been on a little bit of a come down from that world cup and definitely didn't feel like I was at my best for it and even even when I got to a point during that BBL where I was like all right I'm up for this now I wasn't bowling as well as I could have anyway. So um, look, looking back on that, a bit disappointed. But to finish the summer the way we did in the in the white ball stuff for Australia was was great. And then now to kind of put my feet up and think about the the last eighteen months has has been really nice. Um, and now I'm getting to that point too, where it's you know it's getting close to mid April, and I'm starting to you know my mind's starting to work towards that that World Cup a little bit. I'm already starting to think about it, which is it's a nice feeling because I've had that break and. Yeah, now I'm excited to, to get ready for it. Hey, how do you approach it? And this is instructional for any spinner, especially young spinners coming through and, and you being like basically the first picked because um, every white ball team that Australia picks these days needs at least one spinner. So I'm looking at it from an opposition point of view. Let's try and take down Adam Zampa. And, and with mixed success, some teams have and some teams have just not been able to do it. How do you approach it when you know a team is trying to take you down in your four overs or ten overs allotted in a white ball game for Australia? Yeah, it always it depends on you know the, the people that I have around me always make my life a lot easier in terms of you know whether or not teams are going to try and take me down. Um, having guys like Josh Hazelwood, Pat Cohen's bowling at the other end, naturally you're always going to be a better chance at, at taking wickets anyway. Um, but like I'm a, I take my planning really seriously. So I always feel like no matter who I'm up against, I'm really well prepared for that battle anyway. Um, and then to have the experience of Dan mm. Vittori, Andrew McDonald, who have seen me bowl so much, throwing ideas at me as well. I always feel like I've got a lot of bases covered. Um, and as you said, sometimes it doesn't work. Like I'll get I'll get taken down. Um, and some days I'll have success, but um, I always feel like no matter what the end result, I'll always be prepared for what happens next time anyway. You talk of people around you. What about having Andrew McDonald around in your present national team coach as opposed to a JL or a Buff, Darren Lehman? How's it kind of morphed into one thing or another under a new guy? You know, Buff, Buff and JL were similar in the fact that like under Buff, I wasn't bowling that well anyway, and I was a young guy trying to work my way into the team. Um, and his approach to coaching was always around the quick bowling. They'd won a World Cup with quick bowling, so I didn't really get to experience his coaching as much. Um, whereas the difference between JL and Ronnie is that Ronnie's strength is his tactical side whereas you know JL coming at a time where we needed a kick in the ass um, and we got it 
and now we're all really experienced. So Ronnie brings that that tactical nous, um, mm. and he's yeah he's brilliant at it. He's his ability to read the game, um, give advice, and then give feedback as well is is his strength. It is with me anyway. Um, he was a really good player of spin. I remember bowling to him when I was a young guy. So he's got a good good lens on it. Um, and then, you know, he's close with Dan Vittori and he's got Dan in a couple of years ago who, you know, he's one of the best spin bowlers to, to have played the game um, in all three formats as well. So I've got got two really good guys there who um, I can lean on. And, um, yeah, it's been it's been great to have that. Like I had Shri who was working under JL and who, who was great for me tactically. Um, so to work under three you know, really good tactical coaches in the last four or five years has been been a massive reason why I feel like I've, you know, where I am where I am. Could you ever see yourself uh, coaching or do you think trying to kind of think for 15 other people at the one time is just simply an idiotic thing to do with your time? Um, if you'd asked me when I was a young guy, I definitely would have said, hell no, get me away from cricket. Um, but the older I get... Um, and the more of an impact I see people like Andrew and, and Daniel have on on players and the way they kind of have impacted me, I think maybe my thoughts have changed. I don't know if head coaching would be um, <laughs> my kind of thing, but I would love to get to a point where someone like Tanvi Sanger would feel like he can he can call me and lean on me to, to help out. Um, you know, I'm, I really like the, um, the nous of spin bowling um, and working with young spinners is something that I'd potentially be keen on keen on looking at one day if if they wanted to. Um, as I said, but yeah, definitely not not head coaching. I've I'm sick of travelling, mate. Um, you know, by the time cricket's done, I reckon I w- would love to give up my frequent fly points. <laughs> You'll have a few though. Can I have them? <laughs> um, T20 World Cup, let's get to that now. So you've played in the Caribbean Premier League, you've played 13 internationals for Australia in the Caribbean. Take us into your kind of preparation for how those decks are going to play for your skill set. Yeah, um, the Caribbean's always an interesting place to play because you you don't know what you're going to get wicket-wise. Um, they can be really low and slow. They can absolutely rag um, and then... Some of those night games, the wickets can be really good. Um, I remember playing some CPL games where the ball would get hit along the grass and you'd literally see the water flicking up um, beside the ball. So Drew can can play a massive part at night games there. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's great to have experience there. I think I've had two tours there plus two two CPLs. So I kind of know you know the ground dimensions and the wickets um, over there pretty well. So... Yeah, for me, it's it's going to be, I think with the Australian cricket team, it's really nice to know, you know, my role was pretty clear. It's going to be get wickets through the middle and then potentially holding myself back for one to bowl later in the later in the inning. So, yeah, kind of got my head around that already. And as I said, I'd like to be really well prepared. So be doing a little bit of work behind the scenes to make sure I'm leaving no stone unturned. Just before I get back to the T20 World Cup preps, just looking at your teams played for, so give us a, a number one seed out of the social setting. What's the number one seed, the best one, out of Caribbean Premier League, Indian Premier League, Bish, Big Bash League, the 100? <laughs> well, you're a, you're a professional, so you, you, you prefer to skip that. No, that's fine. I'll, I don't mind that question. It's just uh, there's going to be different times of my life you know, that I'll, that will pop up when I'm thinking of memories of these competitions. Um, I'm going to have to say, I mean, the 100 is is great. Um, I love playing cricket in England. And last year I was lucky enough to play for the Oval Invincibles and playing at the Oval in front of a pack crowd on a Friday night doesn't get much better. Um, I reckon looking back, on my Big Bash career, the first couple of years I played at the Melbourne Stars when we had KP, 
Um, we had Eddie running the show. We used to do season launches. We all get dressed up in suits. We carry on like pork chops. That was, you know, we used to run around Melbourne thinking we, <laughs> we own the place. And that was, um, yeah, I've got pretty fond memories of those times as well. Well, you basically did because you had Ed in charge. So Eddie Maguire, what was he like as a, I don't know, a, a mentor, a, a bundle of enthusiasm? He's enthusiastic about everything, Ed. He goes down to the bakery, he's enthusiastic about bank, buying his daily bread. So what's a what's a memory of having him in charge and, and trying to get the most out of the stars and get as many people to the game because that was what it was about for him? Yeah, I mean, um, they, were, they were great memories. Um, he didn't show his face a hell of a lot, but when he did, it you know it was it was energizing. It was here, guys. Here's a here's a rooftop. Have a good night. Um, this is a season launch. Um, yeah, he used to get up and make speeches and get everyone everyone pumped up. Um, and then he'd show his face after the game and um, you know make you really feel like you were part of a rock star franchise. Um, you know, here's a bus with your faces on it. Um, here's a private jet with your face on it. Nah, that, that didn't really happen, but um, <laughs> felt like he could have could have almost got us there. Um, but yeah, playing playing at the Stars when Eddie was involved was um, was really special. Mm. Um, playing under you know Stephen Fleming as well, who you know rocked up at the same time as I did at the Stars. Kevin Peterson was there. We used to get some absolute superstars in. Um, of world cricket, so be involved then when Eddie was around. Was yeah, as I said, fond memories of that. So we got railroaded there. Back to the T Twenty World Cup and and winning another one and giving Larry another trophy to hold on your on your leg there. Uh, what gives you the confidence that you've the team has got enough depth and they've got the mix right to um, to give it a shake again? I think looking back on the last two World Cups. Um, that we've won anyway. It's just experience that I think gets you over the line in in games that are, you know, look like they could go either way, really. I think you look back at the World Cups, Matthew Wade storing us in the middle, um, winning us games pure, purely and simply just because I think they'd been there and done it before. Um, and they're, they're, mm. they're just two examples of guys who I think, you know, I've got a lot of experience now, but... Um, yeah, into the mix, guys like Tim David, um, who's playing a lot of T20 cricket, and then the top three, you know, playing playing really well as well. So, um, and then the bowling attack, um, as I said, just really a lot of experience, played a lot together. Um, and I don't know, something about sitting in the change room with the Australian cricket team in big games, it's quite a comforting feeling. You always look around and go, you know, can we... You know, there's, there's, there's someone in who's going to stand up today, um, which is which is amazing. Mm. It was the same during the during the one day final in India. It was like remember having the the goosebumps and the butterflies about to walk out and walking out and going. It's pretty cool to be walking out with someone today who's potentially going to to win us a World Cup and and Hedy did it. Happened to be that slob you used to work uh, live with down there in Adelaide, huh? He's come a long way. The same slob won us the World Cup who left lasagna in the fridge for about 18 months. No. What colour was it? Oh, tinge of green, I reckon. Hedy's the type of bloke to leave. Hedy's the type of bloke to leave lasagna in the fridge for 18 months, and then instead of just throwing out the lasagna, he'll throw out the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just terrific. Just terrific. <laughs> hey, you won't be going to the US for the the T20 World Cup. You, you're going back for the Major League Cricket, though, this year? Um, no, I'm not this year. I've, you know, highlighted the World Cup as kind of my priority. And then, I, as I said, loved the 100. Um, I don't think I could fit both in, so I've decided to play the 100 um, as a little bit of a precursor yep. to another tour in England, which we have straight after. I think we um, were scheduled... On a Guinness tour of Ireland, um, which I think's been cancelled, and now we're hoping that a whiskey tour of Scotland gets organised. So, mm. waiting to hear on that one. It sounds like a golf tour, actually. So that's a shame about the the Major League Cricket because it means you'll have to to hang up the old four hundred and twenty on the uh, 
on the hook. So we were <laughs> pontificating on Willow Talk 420, why you'd choose that. And, and innocent Brad Haddon, country boy, you know, brought up in Queenby and all that, he goes, oh, well, it's it's maybe just a, a lighthearted joke about 4 and 20 pies, whatever. But me, and this is probably more about me than anything else, I went, well, I think it's actually got to do with April 20. So can you just enlighten us? Oh, <laughs> can... I'm not sure Cricket Australia would allow you to wear the 420, but anyway. <laughs> I can clarify that Hads is a long way off the mark. That's all I can say. <laughs> Again. Again. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll leave that right there. And uh, anyone who has no idea what we're talking about, don't worry about it. <laughs> Just on that tour of England, though, you'll play your 100th One Day International over there. That's yeah. a pretty p- proud milestone for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I mean... It doesn't really happen that often these days either to, to play 100 ODIs. You look back, you know, when I was watching ODI cricket and you see guys play 200, 250 games um, for the Australian cricket team it, just with, you know, the scheduling and the amount of one-day cricket we actually play, not many guys reach that milestone. So, um, yeah, it's definitely going to be a proud moment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a couple of times, I still can't believe I've played this much for Australia. I still pinch myself that I'm in the Australian cricket team. Um, so for the, you know, to be able to get to 100 ODIs, um, it's a definitely a goal that I've mm. set myself at one time in my career. So to get there is, um, that's a massive milestone. I'm, I'm bloody excited. Absolutely. 99 ODIs and 80 T20. So the, the 100 T20 is around the corner as well. So congratulations on those numbers, mate. It's it's awesome. What about, though, have you at any point in the last five years, have you thought, yeah, the, the white ball stuff's going really well, but should I pivot a bit and maybe make a run at the red ball stuff as well? Um, it's hard now with, with Shield cricket bumping into things like tours of England like this year and and the like, but have you, have you ever thought about that and, and what the test ambitions might be for you? Um, yeah, I've always been, you know, when, whenever asked in the media or, um, you know, if it's ever been brought up to me, I've always been quite honest about where I feel like I sit in the scenario um, to get a bag of green as was always a dream of mine as a child and um it's just not worth enough for me to give up what I'm doing now in the white team. Never never has come across my mind to be like I really want to bag green that much that I'm gonna give up what I'm doing in the white ball team. Um and being a part of the white ball team means you got you don't get to play shield cricket. So any conversations I've had with selectors or been asked in the media it's always like, well I feel like what I've done in the white wall team is potentially good enough to to maybe get me a crack. Um, and it hasn't been so far. I feel like maybe it's been close a couple of times to maybe getting on a couple of tours, particularly that Indian one last year. But, you know, I'm, I feel like you know, I'm, I've always been a really honest reflector on, on my game and, and I feel like I can see what cricket is and watching that test series in India I thought I don't think I don't think it was for me um, you know you watch mm. finger spinners do really well you don't see a lot of wrist spinners in test cricket anymore and I remember being a bit disappointed that I wasn't on that tour because I was still had that burning desire um, but then you watch guys like Matt Kuhneman and Gaz and Murph bowl finger spin and get the reaction out of the wicket that they could um, I just thought you know it's fair enough that I'm probably sitting at home and, and not over there. Yeah, as I said, I feel like I can be pretty pretty honest with you about that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, in terms of moving forward, it's going to be the same. If I can get on a tour from from my white ball performances, then, then great. But if not, I'm certainly not going to give up, um, yeah, what I'm, what I'm doing. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm being silly with this comment but you know winning world cups you know if i could end up with my career with a few world cups under my belt and i don't end up with a baggy green i think i'd think i'd take that over over playing one test match for australia fair enough fair enough and um 
you sound like a guy who's always going to always find spots in the calendar to prioritize normal life and um and being a dad and being a husband and being on the property as well you're a farmer there are you or is it just a nice little hobby place at the back of the byron bay hinterland there um if i could change the property into a size that made it into a hobby farm that'd be great but i think 70 acres probably makes it just out of that hobby farm zone um so it, yeah it's big it enough keeps me on my, yeah it keeps me on keeps me on my toes that's for sure um and yeah it was a, it was a great move when i did it i did it you know around around covid it was a change of lifestyle that's for sure and um it was kind of a risk at the time but um yeah I'm, i've never looked back i, I love love um my property i love that lifestyle i love the fact that i can shut the gate get away from the game get away from all those responsibilities and then you know that that's my life and then once i leave the gate to go on tour i feel like i you know can get that balance right and so far it's it's worked out really well who's got the better balance uh, or ability to look after rural pasture yourself or pat cummins um i've got a feeling i might win this one um i don't know i've got a feeling that patty might outsource a lot of um his help i think <laughs> you're being very careful with your words about the captain there and i can understand why adam well we, he's never he's never invited anyone over not that i know of anyway um but every time he shows me a photo of his orchard, it's looking really good. And I go, when was the last time you were in the orchard? And I kind of think I know the answer was probably six months before the photo was shown to me. So I don't know who's working hard on that property, but I don't know if it's coming. Mate, all we can do in life is look after our own backyard. So you, you're obviously pretty happy with uh, what's going on in your backyard. Um, good luck with whatever's coming around the corner with the, the cricket and enjoying yourself away from cricket and really appreciate your time on Willow Talk, mate. Good luck for the T20 World Cup. Beautiful. No worries. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks for watching the Willow Talk podcast on YouTube. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't have to miss an episode wherever you are. And while you're at it, check out these videos up here. They're mostly good.